The episode archive of Your Creative Push is now easier than ever to navigate. Head to yourcreativepush.com and click Episodes at the top. There you'll see all the episodes listed by date and by genre. Every episode of YCP is meant to inspire you, regardless of your creative passion, but you can now easily find the ones that fit your creative medium when you need a little extra push. Your Creative Push, episode 235. I, you know, every like external force is there for you and wants you to do it, and like I really hope that you can give yourself permission. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I am your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Zan Romanoff. Zan is a writer of essays and fiction, and she is the author of A Song to Take the World Apart and her latest novel, Grace and the Fever. Zan and I go really deep into the idea of writer's block and also the process that a writer goes through, which is very similar to all other creative endeavors. One of the things we talked about was the idea of talking about your own creative passion with other people that might not get it (laughs) and uh, wanting to kind of protect your creative passion from scrutiny, from jokes, or just even small talk, how it can be a very precious thing to us and we really want to protect it. We talked about the similarities and the differences between writing and therapy. Very interesting. And we talked about her long period of writer's block after breaking up with her long-term boyfriend. And the big problem with that being that her boyfriend was also her ideal reader, her audience, and how she had to make that shift after that relationship was gone. Also, the idea of coming down with a book coming down with a book like like it's a cold <laughs> and how to deal with it and how to get it out into the world. We talk about how selling your first book doesn't necessarily solve any problems for you uh, with your creative blocks. It doesn't make you feel like any less of a fraud and you still have those thoughts of needing permission from people. This is something that we got really deep into, this idea of needing permission. And probably my favorite story was about the unexpected result of one of her pieces ending up in the Paris Review. So if you've ever struggled with that feeling of needing permission to do something, uh, her story is really going to hit close to home for you because sometimes that external permission does come and you might not be ready for it and how to handle that scenario. So just a really fun talk with a down-to-earth writer, a down-to-earth creative person that has a really good finger on the pulse of her own creative being. Uh, so I won't waste any more time. Here it is, my conversation with Zan Romanoff. Zan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks <laughs> for being here. Um, I guess we like to start out uh, like we usually do. Uh, kind of give us a brief bio of how you got into writing or basically your creativity uh, and then how you got to the point you are today. Yeah. Um, so my mom is a writer. So I, you know, grew up very much um, in a house where people like adults were writing. And that was considered like a normal way to spend an afternoon, you know, was to sit down and like make up a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad is a photographer. So definitely like a lot of creativity in the house. But I always loved writing. It was always my favorite thing to do is, like, you know, favorite subject in school, which I feel like is pretty standard. If you talk to writers, always like, I've been writing my whole life. <laughs> And because of that, it took me a really long time to figure out that it was something that I was interested in doing beyond like as a hobby, you know, like, and especially because also like I grew up in the era of blogs. Um, so, you know, I kept like a live journal in high school. Um, me too. My Zanga. <laughs> oh my, yes. <laughs> um, and like wrote, you know, wrote a little bit in college, but I really didn't understand that it was a thing I wanted to do. And I was working actually in the sustainable food world uh, for a couple of years after college and then moved across the country and, and anyway, couldn't get a job for a year. And um, during that year was sort of like, oh, you know, what's the thing that I wake up every day and do even though I don't have to, even though frankly, like doesn't seem like anyone wants me to. <laughs> right. Um, and the answer was writing. And so that was that was sort of when I started to take it more seriously. And that, during that year was when I had time to write um, the first draft of my first novel. Um which, you know, it's funny, like now I know that and I'm like, everyone's like, oh, you're so lucky you had all that time. And like, I absolutely am. And also at the time I was just like, I mean, if I don't do something <laughs> with, you know, I was just, cause I didn't know it was going to end and I didn't know the book was going to be a novel. It was just like waking up every day, facing down the abyss and being like, well, <laughs> gotta do something. 
like the only thing scarier than writing a novel is permanent unemployment, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I, th- I feel like when people get in that situation where they do find themselves with that time, a lot of times it does get um, scary to do something like write a novel to like actually like really focus all of your energy into like whatever your creative passion is and trying to make that into something. So what is it that kind of spurred you to <laughs> have that <laughs> thought that I want to really pursue this and not just kind of um, waste this time for, for lack of better term. Yeah. So I, okay. So that's not entirely, uh, I had been, I kept up having a blog, you know, sort of one platform to another. And when I'd been living in Connecticut and working, I'd been writing on a Tumblr. And that was sort of the first time I feel like that I really found a community as a writer. Um, Other writers like followed that blog. My friends knew about it. Um, and I'd gotten a lot of really good encouragement from that. People have been like, oh, you're like really good at this. <laughs> um, you know, you should keep doing this. I was like, oh, <laughs> thank you. Like I genuinely, I don't know, it sounds sort of weird or self-deprecating to say now, but I genuinely just didn't know. I was like, oh, like, thank you. I did not know that. Well, you um, need that sometimes. You definitely need that sometimes. Yeah. And again, like, you know, I was just saying like, you know, I didn't know if anyone wanted me to do it. And like having that first push of people saying like, you know, I like reading this, you know, and sort of pointing me towards other opportunities. So I had written an essay. My little brother at the time was running uh, this like online fashion magazine, like little student project. He was in school. Anyway, I'd written an essay for him and a friend encouraged me to submit it to a zine that someone was doing. And then the people who were running the zine got it put um, on the Paris Reviews blog, um, which was like wow. the craziest. Yeah. Went from being like a thing that I had literally written in the morning before work, you know, to being like on this big professional big deal website when that happened, people had reached out to a couple of people, like agents had reached out to me and said, Hey, do you have a book? And I was like, Oh no. <laughs> like, oh, nice. I, yeah. It was, it was amazing. And also it was terrifying. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't have a book. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, this is my opportunity. And I blew it. I was like, that's it. <laughs> like, right. That's the, the initial thought is that, uh, no, I don't like opportunity wasted. Yeah, no, exactly. It was like, Oh, this is it. Like, instead of being like, Oh, this is opening a door for me. I was like, Oh, and I went from being like, no one cares if I write to being like, people care. And I've already blown my opportunity and it's over. <laughs> right. Um, but so I, when I moved back to Los Angeles, which is where I live now, that had all kind of just happened and it had really, really shifted my thinking about my writing. And I, I, so I came back to LA a little bit with the thought of like, well, it might take me a minute to get a job. And so I'm going to like take a writing class um, to, to fill some time. And it was in that writing class, again, got like, you know, so much positive reinforcement and also discovered that I, I mean, I kind of knew this about myself, but like, was reinforced again, that I could like write on deadline, Um, you know, that like given an assignment, I was pretty good at that. So like, coming out of that class, I sort of felt strong about what I was doing and my ability to write a little bit of fiction. But so I will say also that when I started writing the book, I did not, it was not like I'm going to write a novel. Um, I had written a short story in this writing class that I really liked. And I was like, okay, what if that was like the beginning of a short story collection? Maybe like that seemed like an approachable, okay, you know, thing. I was like, well, I can write a series of short stories and that's like a a manageable goal. Mm -hmm. Um, And then really what happened was that I started working on the second short story and I just never stopped (laughs) and it became the novel. (laughs) Um, So yeah, but I I always say like I, I backed myself into it in a lot of ways. Like I really totally tricked myself into writing that first book. I never would have been able to sit down and and be like, I'm writing a book. That was just like, that was way too scary of a, a phrase for me. And even actually after I'd written the whole thing, I'd revised the whole thing. It wasn't until I went to a conference when I was looking for an agent and I had to like talk to people all day and like I had to pitch my book to people that I became capable of saying the words I wrote a book before that I would say I wrote a long dumb thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or like, I, yeah, I wrote a really long word doc or like, you know, my big weird project. <laughs> like, but yeah, like, you know, it, it, it took me a long, it, the whole thing took me a long time. <laughs> right. Well, and that, 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 what you just said is, I think, something that I try to encourage people to do is to, like, practice saying that you're this thing and not just like, oh, I have a blog or I have um, something, you know, a, a Microsoft Word document of ideas <laughs> or short things. Like, no, just like be like, I'm a writer. Like, that's all like if you write, 
you could go call yourself a writer. If you paint, you get to call yourself a painter. Um, yeah. And just like kind of trying to own that as much as you can. It's a hard thing to do, especially with like imposter syndrome and just like feeling like you need permission sometimes. Like you need somebody else to tell you that you're this thing. Um, it's totally natural thing to do. Like with you, like <laughs> meeting people to say, oh, you know, you kind of have a talent in this to like kind of push you to do that. I had the same exact experience. It was one professor my senior year of college when I had a completely unrelated major that that I took a writing course and there she's like why well, you have a talent for this and that spurred me you know what I mean so it's like you you need that sometimes yeah this is actually it's funny like I used to fight with my friends about this um when I was working uh so I, I did eventually get a job um and I was doing event programming at a local Jewish community center like people we would be at parties and people would say like you know what do you do and I would say I work at a Jewish community center and my friends would be like she's a writer <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's not what they're asking. Like, they're asking how I spend my day. And like, the answer is that I do programming at a Jewish community center. And also, fair enough, like, at that point, I'd, I was like, I sold a book. Like, I, I, I am technically a writer. <laughs> right. But it is, it's like, it's a really interesting mindset thing. And, and for me, I will say, like, it never, calling myself a writer was never, because I've been writing my whole life, whatever, like, calling myself a writer was not a struggle for me. Um, but I do, I have a lot of friends who really, really, really struggle with that. Like, the, yeah, they, they took them years to like acknowledge or call themselves, you know, to be able to, to like, own the phrase, like, I'm a writer. But I will say also, actually, that like, you know, I talk a lot about, yeah, the, the sort of how much it took me to like get comfortable with that and to own it. And I'm really glad that I did it, you know, that I went through all of that and that I got other people's permission, whatever. And then the next step is like, you gotta, you gotta say fuck permission. <laughs> right. <laughs> because the next step is that no one, like, you know, all these, like, nice people have been like, oh, you're really good at this. And then I started looking for professional validation. Like, I started looking for an agent and I heard no a hundred gazillion times. And I had to decide, like, you know, oh my God, now no one's giving me permission. Like, no one is encouraging me to do this. How, you know, do I want it badly enough? Am I gonna fight? Like, and, and ultimately, like, thank God the answer was yes. But like, it, it's, it's, it's pretty fucking harrowing. <laughs> the whole thing yeah. is just really hard. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing. And, and I don't think it ever gets easier. And that's the whole point of, of the show is, you know, people from all different creative fields in all different uh, lengths of their journey at different points in their journey, all kind of struggle from these same things. And uh, they just keep coming up. <laughs> and it is yeah. terrifying. And it, it, we can all get through this together. But yeah, I think what you're saying is right. And I think your friends were right back then, too. It's I think people should define themselves not by the thing that they do in their day job. It's by the thing that like really drives them, the thing that re they're really passionate about or want to eventually be their job. And I, Big Brother is my favorite reality show. Well, and it's <laughs> one of the only shows that I watch these days. Yeah, last night was the premiere and I was like, oh man, like if I was on, what would it say under my name? Like, would it say poker dealer? Cause that's my full time job. And that I was, uh -huh. no, fuck no. Like, <laughs> no, like writer slash podcaster slash motivator. Like, that's what like drives me. And like, I hate my job. Like, why would I define myself by that? You know what I mean? So I think yeah. it's trying to like own what it is that you're the most passionate about, whether you make money by it or not. It's like the thing that you want to talk about. If somebody yeah. asks you what you are, tell them what you want to talk about, you know? Yeah, no, I do. And okay, so I will also say that like one of the reasons that I never said writer is because I hate talking about being a writer at parties. <laughs> like, yeah, that's I was like, I was like, you guys, it's not a confidence issue. Like, I'm totally a writer. I get it. Like, I was just like, I don't like people have like want to ask me these questions that like you just get a little bored of answering. And like, I do. I also like I feel very protective of like my creative life. You know, like I don't ever want it to be something that I feel obligated to talk like to make small talk about. You know, I'm like, no, this is like the most important thing in the entire world to me. Like, you know, I, sometimes I just don't want to chat about it over drinks. Like, I don't want to explain my project. I don't want to explain why I don't want to explain my project. I don't want mm -hmm. people, like, ask me about book sales, which is so rude. Have I asked you how much you made this year? Like, no. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I'm just like, I totally get that it's my job. Um, I mean, now it's my job, which is, like, just insanely lucky. And, you know, I figured out now ways to talk about it sort of – and. But it's it's difficult. That's I mean, that's also I think a very difficult thing of being a, a working creative is like figuring out how to protect, you know, for lack of a better term, like the magic. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh you know, while also like then dealing with, you know, the the business of it and the just life of it and the part where you go to parties and someone's like, What do you do? And you're like, I'm a writer. And then, you know, they ask you whatever. You're like, I've they're like, I have a great idea for a book. And you're like, Great, you should write that. Like you be a writer too, honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's a, it's a precious thing. And uh, like, especially when it means so much to you. And it's this this thing that brings you joy. You don't want to have to like, 
defend it <laughs> like, <laughs> to somebody who doesn't understand or like and it's it's one thing when people are trying to like understand you a little bit better but yeah. it's another thing when they're like oh well like is that a viable way to make a living because like we're so as creative people we're so used to hearing that like the starving artist mentality and yeah. it's like no like, well, like i don't want to have to defend this right now <laughs> right when people i'm like i'm a writer people are like well, what do you really do i'm like no i'm a writer <laughs> like literally right. all i do is write i'm like i have words i'm like i'm surprised you can't see like words coming out of my ears right <laughs> like right. all I do is right. Well, yeah. The other thing about that is that you know people read. Like I think mm-hmm. most people read, but like not everybody will read what you write anyway. So mm-hmm. it's like hard. Not only do you have to defend the practice of being a writer in general, but then you have like they might not dig what you you do. Like you you're a YA writer, and not I everybody. Was say, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have an interesting version of the problem where I'm like, I write YA and a lot of people are like, oh, I love YA, like The Hunger Games and like Harry Potter, fantastic Mm. books, like not, you know, I love those Mm -hmm. books too. It's part of how I got into writing YA. They're not like the books that I write, which are much more literary and a little more quiet. And people have this like assumption, A, actually that I make a lot of money because I write YA. They're like, oh, that's like a big selling genre. Like you must be like, and you have a movie deal and all this stuff. And I'm like, really? No, <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's much, much closer to the experience of being like a literary fiction, you know, type novelist, but also that creatively it's not as hard. People are like, oh, it must be fun. And I'm like, it, it's a hundred percent fun. And I like, I do it cause I love it. Like no question. And also like, it's writing a novel. Like I'm, I'm writing novels. It's not any different. <laughs> like, it's not a different kind of process. <laughs> Um, which is really interesting, you know, all, all the baggage people have around that. Um, yeah, and, and people's sort of opinions about why. That's the other thing. I'm just like, I don't want to hear your, you know, I don't want to hear your vampire book joke. Like, I've heard that joke a 100,000 times. And like, I can smile good naturedly at it, but it's like not funny and it hurts my feelings. You know, I'm like, I take my work really seriously. It is like the thing I care most about. It's like terrifying to me. I actually had a really funny experience. So right before my second book came out, I like had an advanced copy of it and I went to give it to my therapist um, who I've been seeing for like years now, you know, like weekly, like she's seen me in like such intimate, like vulnerable ways. And like, you know, she's a person that I would think that I sort of have no more shame in front of and still handing her the book. I was like, Oh my God, like what if she doesn't like it? (laughs) Yeah. You know, but like, that's the level that these books are at to me. And so then to have people sort of like make crass or like, just, you know, like they just think they're being funny and it's fine. Like, But again, I'm like, no, this is the thing I'm like so protective over and that means so much to me. Like, don't, don't touch it. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, do you find, if you don't mind talking about that then, um, do you find uh, like a similarity between uh, like a therapy session and writing? (sighs) No. I mean, well, okay, but only no, because like ultimately do they get me to the same place? I think kind of. Um, The difference is that when I'm in therapy, I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) <laughs> um, and like when I'm writing, like but this is really true and it's, it's continually amazing to me, even though I now know this about myself. Like I've written, I have two published books. I have a third one that's like written that hopefully we're, we're going to sell soon. So like I've done this a couple of times. I've, I've written other book drafts in, in the interim that didn't really go anywhere, which we can talk about. Um, so like I know this about myself. Like I'm in there. Like it's, you know, whatever's going on with me is coming out through the book. And it, it every time I'm writing a book, I'm like, no, 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 this one's about someone else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like. I feel like therapy is for me, you know, much more sort of off the top of like what's happening on a day to day basis. And writing books is a way of like deeply working out, you know, sort of longer, longer tail stuff. And I, it's like, I feel really hesitant saying that because I think especially women's writing people, if like you cop to it being autobiographical in any way, people are like, oh, well, like that, that it's just, it's just therapy. Like it's just, you know, autobiography. Like it doesn't require creative effort. But I like, I don't know. I think that's just super fucking bullshit. And I think everyone's writing is autobiographical. I think anyone who tells you that it's not is lying mm. <laughs> or, or is not aware enough to see the ways in which it is. You know, it's coming from inside of you. Working on a book takes so long. It, you know, it's such a, such an intensive process with yourself. Um, there's just no way that like you are not in there. You wouldn't be interested if you weren't in there. Right. Yeah. So like, it's like, I, it, it's funny on the one hand, I'm very reticent to compare it to therapy. On the other hand, I'm like, yeah, hundred percent. Like it's, it's about figuring out what's going on inside of me and how to like express and in some ways, like not extract it, but like, you know, get it out of me like a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And it's important to do that too. Yeah. And then kind of going along with that. So as YA, I, I've heard you say like you're, you're into that stuff. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about that? I guess a little bit like how, when you write, are you thinking about your audience? Like, is that 
coming into your mind? Like, do you ever have to hold back or are you just kind of like putting a lot of like what you're interested in anyway in there? Um, yeah, no, I, I don't have to hold back. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. I have a really cool editor um, who totally gets like my, you know, what I'm interested in. And, it, you know, there are definitely houses and there are editors where they're sort of like, you know, want to have a, a different kind of YA than the kind that I write. Because to me, I'm like, look, when I was a teenager, like, my friends were having sex, like my friends were drinking and doing drugs. And like, you know, I knew about, you know, family members were addicts. And like, uh, there's not much I didn't know as a t- I mean, there's plenty I didn't know as a teenager. <laughs> Right. <laughs> there's but there's not a lot I didn't know about, you know, and the idea that like teenagers are like unaware of any of these sort of bigger issues is to me just like I'm just like that's silly. Like I I've never written anything in my books that I didn't do when I was a teenager. And in fact, I've done lots of things when I was a teenager that I have not written into my books. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cuz I'm like I don't think that we need to talk about that. Yeah. Um but I really you know, I feel like I mean like every other human being on planet Earth, I made a lot of mistakes in my adolescence and currently it's important to me to like, and and I did like I didn't see myself reflected in a lot of the books that I read about teenagers, and I it like it only added to my impression that adults were bullshitting me, you know. And I was like, well, I'm not gonna listen to them about fucking anything because like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so you gave me permission to curse, and now I'm like, all right, we're going. Here we go. Floodgates um, re- open. <laughs> not a YA audience. We're good. <laughs> I, I, you, well, but like this is a thing, right? Is like you. I mean, you hear me talk, and like I write this way too, and I write my dialogue this way because because mm-hmm. again, I'm like this is how I talked when I was a teenager, and I think it is important. It's really important to me because I, it, it's really true. Like I remember, I was like, if adults think that like this is who I am and what I know, like they don't know anything, and I shouldn't listen to them about anything, and it's like. <laughs> mm-hmm. they were bullshitting me about some stuff but not about everything um and so that's you know i i want to write books that teens trust um you know that feel like authentic to like the lives that they are living and the things that they like know and understand and also to the things that they're just figuring out right that like you can know a lot of stuff and like you know you can like drink a lot of alcohol and like kiss a lot of boys or kiss a lot of girls or whoever you're kissing like but like there's just there's stuff in terms of like emotional intelligence and who you are that you're still figuring out, right? Um, and that like having all these sort of like external markers of adulthood doesn't make you emotionally, you know, a grown up. And I think that's to me, that's a lot what my books are about is, is about balancing people who like can do anything, right? They're like, I can drive a car and I can like, yeah, go and like stay up all night and drink and get crazy. And like, and also like, I don't understand how that behavior is going to affect p- other people or myself yet. Sorry, I feel like I wandered. Is that an answer to the question? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, I think the the lesson there is like to just respect them um, and to be honest yourself as well. Yeah, this is I actually had a really interesting conversation with a friend of mine who does a podcast for YA writers about this, about the ways in which YA is one of the few um, genres that or categories that requires you to to write for an audience that's explicitly not yourself. Right? Like if you're writing Mm -hmm. literary fiction, you can imagine that the reader looks like you. If you're writing sci fi or fantasy for adults, whatever, like you can imagine that the reader is your, you know, is yourself. When I say young adult explicitly immediately, it's like, this is not for me. Um, and so it requires you to imagine your audience in a, I think a cool and useful way, um, a scary way sometimes. Cause I'm like, oh my God, like, I don't know what teenagers want. (laughs) I'm freaking 30 years old. Like, but it also, like, I think is, it's a very interesting exercise as an artist in terms of sort of like, considering empathy and and trying to figure out who you're writing for and how to make that happen. Well, if we can go back to the, the Paris review piece. um, Yeah. So that was kind of like one of those like turning point moments where beforehand, like you had a couple people that said that your writing is good and maybe you should do it. And then all of a sudden after this, you have an actual opportunity uh, where you're like, Oh, this is like a real thing. Did your writing style change after that? Like, was it easier before that happened to like kind of write freely if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, totally. Um. Y- yeah. So, I. So okay. So, two things that happened, I should say also, like, the Paris Review thing happened, and right around the same time, I broke up for good with this guy I'd been dating on and off for, like, years. And he's also a writer, and he, like, I'd been writing for him, to him, about him, like, you know, sort of unconsciously, but, like, he was my reader for, like, years and years and years. And so, like, I, I simultaneously, like, lost him as a, an imaginary reader and also gained this like imaginary, like New York literary agent critic person as my Mm. reader, Mm -hmm. which is very hard. And I started trying to write a book. Actually, I decided again, like I was like, I can't write a, like a whole thing, but I could write a a collection of essays. Like I was like, this was a good essay. I could write a collection of essays. And I wrote like a quarter of one essay and it was bad and I couldn't finish it. And I couldn't write any other ones. And I was super blocked. 
for like months. I, again, I was like, oh, they asked if I had a book. I didn't have one ready. I can't w- write one now. You know, what if this is it? And I've already written the best thing I'll ever write. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Always a great thing to imagine when you're 24. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> yeah. it happens. I know it totally does. But like, not a, like telling yourself that story is not going to get you any closer <laughs> to writing sure. anything better, you know? And and you'd say that the block was happening because of your new uh, like avatar, your new audience. Yeah, I mean, I think, I th- yeah, I think, I mean, I think a lot of things were happening. Um, losing that relationship was just really hard. Sure. Um, you know, and just yeah, emotionally, I was in a pretty bad place anyway. And then also, I was putting a ton of pressure on myself. In terms of permission, like I often say, sort of like I, I both like I needed those literary agents to reach out to me and give me permission and give me the you know the the phrase like you could write a book, but then I also needed to go through like I think it was like oh no actually it was longer than that God it was like a year and a half probably of not writing very much at all until I sat down and started writing the book that like I. Because again, like external permission is really important and it also only gets you so far. And I very quickly discovered that, that like their permission opened a door and then I had to like sit with it for a long time and get to a place where I was comfortable with, with that permission, with the sound of my voice in my head and on the page. They had to give me a certain kind of permission and then I had to give myself a different kind to actually write the book, um, mm-hmm. to, to write what I was interested in and not just like what I thought they would want to read. Right. And then so you started writing that essay which ended up turning into a song to take the world apart. A short story. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. And I, I wrote, but again, also like I wrote that in a writing class. Like I, you know, I, I just like, I had to be tricked into it. Like I had to, or not tricked into it. That's the wrong thing. Well, like take the ease into it. Like yes. not, not have like a, this huge mountain of a thing that you have to accomplish, like before you write the first word, but like, just like an easy little, yeah. I think tricking is a, is a good word. For it. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was an in-class assignment. It was literally like the teacher was like, write an updated version of a fairy tale. And it was a, it was a version of Bluebeard, um, mm. which actually it's funny. So like that, I was obsessed with the story at the time. I remain obsessed with the story to the extent that like my third book is finally, I mean, if you read the two stories, like you wouldn't necessarily see the connection on the face of it. I was putting all this pressure on myself. I needed to go into like a classroom space where it was just like, okay, you know, you're just writing a little assignment. It's literally supposed to be like 15 minutes at the end of class. You can finish it at home if you want to. And that allowed me, you know, to sort of actually get inside and and figure out again, yeah, like I have the external permission and then the internal, like, what am I interested in? Like, what's worth it to me to bring up and like, and work through? Yeah. And and that certain things about that story um, were so compelling to me that I like, you know, this is like whatever, four years ago now, have not been able to let it go. And and did finally like write, you know, a book that is a lot about a lot of those ideas. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just so it's so interesting. You never like also like. I think for a long time, I was trying to work consciously, you know, like I was trying to like decide what I was interested in and like, figure out like what the book was going to be about and like make a plan. And it took me a long time to accept that like, it's just it's like a weird instinctual process. And I never know, you know, what idea is going to be the one that I'm like, care enough about to carry me through until I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I can't sit down and be like, I'm going to write a book about like young women and like family legacies and history and silence and whatever. It's like, I don't write a book about a girl and like her, you know, her mom's like weird and mean and like there's a secret. I don't know. (laughs) That makes a lot of sense because then it's not this big task with all these themes that you need to incorporate and you don't don't have to like plan it out. I So I've never even tried to write a novel (laughs) because (laughs) my mind isn't there and I Mm -hmm. like I'm okay with that at at this point but I think at some point I'm gonna have to get over that and I think it will come from just something not being able to be finished until it reaches you know 200 pages (laughs) (laughs) this is one of my favorite I was at a conference recently and Alexander Chi uh, who wrote a book called Queen of the Night I want to say Someone asked him about like how you know that you you have an idea for a novel, and he's like, I always say that you come down with a novel, sort of like a cold, mm-hmm. you know, which I I loved. It's so expressive to me of the way that it feels, because yeah, because I I used to think that you got an idea for a novel and you'd be like, oh, I know that like this, you know, one idea or this one sentence is like enough. It's really interesting, actually. People ask me often, you know, like how did you get the idea for this book? And I'm always like, I'm sorry, this is not a good story because the answer is like. I read this article and then I saw this thing and then I had this conversation and like, you know, stuff accretes, you know, you just build up this sort of like layers of references and ideas and thoughts and feelings. 
you know, that then are enough to take you through the process. Um, but it is, you come down with it, you know, it just, it starts to happen in your body and you're like, is that a tickle in the back of my throat? Is like a thing or am I going to be, is this going to happen? Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that idea. And I think that that's the same with any kind of uh, like creative idea that people get. And I think that the important thing is to kind of like let it take over you <laughs> and yeah. to not try to like fight it off with different cold medicines or <laughs> you, which th- those cold medicines would be, I guess, you know, just all self doubt and just like not letting it come out. Um, yeah. But if you kind of let it take over and, and find out if it's just a sneeze or if it's like a full on flu and like, yeah. just let it kind of take over your time and all your thoughts until it's actually a thing in the world. Yeah. I think, I think not being afraid of yourself is like the thing you know, like not and not being afraid to succeed and not being afraid to fail. And they're both like very, very, very real <laughs> and really scary. For a really long time, I'd been afraid. I mean, yeah, this thing for a really long time, I was afraid to fail, right? I was like, oh, no one's going to like like this. No one's going to care. And then as soon as I got permission, I was like, oh, I'm terrified. You know, what if I do this? Like, what does that mean? And what's going to happen? And is my life going to change? And like, what if I do it? I mean, once I'd written one book, I spent a year 100% paralyzed being like, what if that was a fluke and I can never write another one? You know, and finally, I've just gotten to a place now where I'm like, you know, you know, I don't know. I just don't know. Like, I've definitely written beginnings of books that haven't gone anywhere. I've written basically a whole book draft that ultimately didn't go anywhere. Like, I was about to write the ending of it. And I was just like, I can't end this book because it has no middle. (laughs) Like, It's not. There's no structure here. (laughs) And just, yeah, but finally, like, being less afraid, being like, I'm not afraid to waste time. I'm not afraid to see where this goes. You know, I just got to trust myself. And I'm allowed to, like, spend time with myself and, and figure this out. You know, ultimately, obviously, in my life now, I'm like, there is a a publishing end goal. And I got to think about business. and I got to think about money. But also, like, I'm allowed to just spend time. Yeah, I'm just allowed to spend time with myself. Like, I'm allowed to just like, be creative, because like, that's what I want to do today. There doesn't have to be another reason. (laughs) Right. That that's the whole purpose is to spend that time like defining yourself by the thing that that really gives you joy and not being worried about that that end result. I think that end result is this the super scary thing. It's yeah. And, and t- anytime you think about those questions, that's what holds you back from creating. What wondering if it's going to sell, if people are going to like it, if an agent's going to like it, if yeah. it's the the best thing you'll ever create, if it's the worst thing that you've created, you know what I mean? Like all those questions just like don't matter. It's just about enjoying that time that you're spending with it, whether it becomes something or not, whether it becomes a a cold or not. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I really, I do feel strongly that like, you know, one of the major differences between me and people who haven't written books is that I sat down and wrote it. (laughs) Right. You know, that I just was like, I was like, I have no idea where this is going. Like, you know, I got I got no special, like the heavens did not open for me. I was just like, all right, I got an idea. I got some time. Like, see, let's see where it goes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and again, like, I, you know, I can't stress enough. I was in an incredibly lucky situation where um, I did have the time. I was living with my parents. Um, so I didn't have to worry about rent. Cause like, I, when I moved back, I was sort of like, well, I'll, I'll live with them until I get a job. And they had the space and, and were generous enough that they were like, you know, it's fine. We don't want you to go into debt. Like, that seems silly. Um, you know, I, I don't want to like underplay the very real, you know, circumstantial stuff that that contributed to me doing that. Um, you know, and also I, I was, I was 25 and single, like, you know, I didn't have kids to take care of, mm-hmm. you know, or anything like that. Those things are 100% real. And then also on top of them, there's all the crazy creative brain stuff, which is just so hard, um, and which I can, you know, that I can speak to. <laughs> right. The getting, the getting in your own way stuff I can speak to all day, all night. <laughs> right. And well, Speaking of that, <laughs> are there <laughs> some things that you've been dealing with recently or like after, you know, two novels now that you still kind of struggle with? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like I said, I, I wrote the first one. I started writing a second one. And I that was the one that I got to the end of it. And I was like, I can't end this book. And that was when I mm-hmm. just became paralyzed and was like, oh, my God, I'm screwed. <laughs> this is a terrible right. mistake. <laughs> right. Um, fluke. <laughs> yeah. Fluke. Yeah. 100%. Beginner's luck. Just like, nah, it's over. And then when my second book came, it, it really came, that was a crazy, like literally I was in the shower and I like, I'd been thinking about the idea for a while, but I couldn't sort of get it started. And I was in the shower and I was like, oh, I know exactly how this book starts. Like I got out of the shower, I wrote like 2000 words. Like it was very magical. But then I got done with that and I was like, well, now I've had two flukes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so writing the third book was really scary. And I was also, uh, this is, I was dealing with very major depression throughout all of this, just really, really, really debilitating depression and anxiety. And, um, and seeing a therapist about it, obviously, you know, and, and eventually getting on medication, which I cannot recommend highly enough if you're thinking about doing it. Like, best thing I ever did for myself 
and I people often have right they're like oh I, like I won't be creative like I I wrote crap books when I was depressed mm. um, I've only written good stuff when I was healthy anyway I'm in a really interesting position right now where I, writing the third book was I sort of made a deal with myself where I was like if you do this you have to stop torturing yourself about whether this is a fluke <laughs> um, you know like once you've done three like you gotta kind of let that go right and so I wrote the third one and, and my agent has it and she likes it. Um, and it seems like it will be my third book. But now I'm in a really interesting place where um, I'm not working on anything and or I'm not working on anything long form. I'm, I'm writing every day because I, I write like essays and things, you know, for work, for the internet and trusting that, that like it will come again. And, you know, that I'm like, I just like, I need a break. Like you can't write novels back to back. That's like an insane psychological exercise. Right. Um, and no one, and it's also like, it's a, it's a market thing in YA that you're expected to churn out a book a year, which is just insane. Like no other novelist is expected to do that. And so giving, actually giving myself permission to stop writing and to take breaks and to believe that it'll come back has been, that. that's what I'm really struggling with right now is allowing myself to be fallow, you know, it's just being like, okay, uh, I trust enough that I know how to do this, that I'll know when an idea comes, you know, at least to start writing and see where it goes. Selling a book crosses selling a book off your bucket list and it solves approximately no other problems in your life <laughs> is <laughs> what I have learned the very hard way. I mean, especially like when, you know, I was, as I say, super, super depressed and I sold that first book and I was like, well, it's going to be fine now. And like, it was so not fine. It was like so desperately not fine. <laughs> mm. I think at the end of the day, like, it's good to have a creative practice, right? It's good to, like, make yourself work on days you don't feel like working. And also, like, creativity is mysterious and kind of magical. And, you know, you just got to, like, believe that you have it. Um, and, like, this is, like, so corny, but you, like, just have to believe in yourself. And it's, like, the hardest thing. There's nothing harder than just, like, coming to the bedrock thing of being, like, whatever, I'm going to do it and it's going to be fine something's going to come out of me. Like I'm going to produce, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep making stuff and I don't know how yet. And I don't know when yet, <laughs> but it's going to happen. Yeah. And that's the shitty part about inspiration is that it kind of comes in spurts. And like, sometimes it comes so fast that you can't even keep up with it. And yeah. Like, that sucks, but it's like a really good feeling to be like kind of in that flow and just to be prepared for it. And so it's like the, the time where it's not coming, it's just like, gearing up to to get ready for it and trusting that it will come back sometimes it takes a while which is like very depressing but like to <laughs> not get down on yourself for that it's not like you're doing anything wrong but to just you know put yourself in a scenario where you can get that inspiration even if it's jumping in the shower that's where i get all my best <laughs> ideas too um or out in nature it's like a very common thing it's just like putting yourself in that scenario so that you can be that kind of a like a, a vessel for it <laughs> yeah no and I, yeah exactly like i just think that like in retrospect, right, I'm like, I, those books, like my, my second books and my second book and my third book, like they were, they were coming when they were coming, like that, you know, um, and all I did was exhaust myself, torturing myself, being like, well, you know, what if it doesn't come? What if it doesn't come? It's like, well, what if it doesn't come? Like, it, is, are these months that you've spent hating yourself for it gonna like make it easier? No. Right. <laughs> it's gonna make it a lot worse. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's, it is, and, and, and that I think, I'm hoping we'll see, we'll check back with me in a, in a year or so, like allowing myself to take the break, you know, and in trying to enjoy the break, um, when I'm not working on a big long project will help it come not faster, but just like, e yeah, easier. This is one of my big things. It's like, what's good for you as a human is good for your work. Taking breaks is good for you. Not being depressed is good for you. Like eating well and going to bed early, you know, just all this shit about like, oh, you got to like be out there experiencing everything to be a writer. You got to be fucking Hunter S. Thompson as nonsense. Like I don't write well when I'm tired. I don't write well when I'm hungover. I don't write well when I'm depressed. <laughs> right. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, f and fortunately, you know, breaks are great because they allow people to come on podcasts. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. I appreciate uh, you spending the time with us. Yeah, no, but you see, I mean, this is again, like, this is, you know, the reason I have time to do stuff like this is because I'm like, oh, I'm out of that intensive mental space, like, you know, where you're just like productive all the time. It's like, yeah, sometimes you get to take a friggin' break and have a nice conversation. Yeah. And, and, and when you're like in that flow where the ideas keep coming and you have opportunities to just put them off to the side for when these times come up, you know, whenever you do have a creative lull so that you can kind of have something to look forward to and something yeah. to take up your time so that you're not asking yourself all these questions that are just going to drive yourself crazy anyway. <laughs> yes, exactly. I love it. <laughs> um, but Zam, we can't let you go until you give us the final push. 
And that's where I ask you to reach to the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best words of advice and really push them to pursue their creative passions. I mean, I really, I think the best thing I can say is like, I give you all the permission in the world. I really do. I, you know, every like external force is, is there for you and wants you to do it. And like, I really hope that you can give yourself permission. Like, you know, you know, okay, when, when I listen to podcasts that, that I've been on and I hear my voice, it's always horrible. I'm always like, oh my God, I do not sound like that. I do not talk like that. <laughs> um, because I don't listen to myself talk all that often. And like, especially with writing, you sort of imagine your voice sounding one way in your head and it's really scary to see it on the page. But like, it's only because you're not used to it yet. You know, that's really like, I, just sit down and get used to it. Just like, <laughs> sit down and get used to yourself. That's the way that the work will get done. And like, and it's cool and it's cool. And I believe you can do it. <laughs> Yes. I yeah, and that, that's like right. I I never believe I can do it, but like I do somehow. So like, if I believe you can do it, you definitely can. <laughs> get out of your own way. Sit down and get some work done. That's my. There's my push. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Zan, thank you so much for for coming on the show today and for giving us that push. Oh, thank you. This has been really fun. Now I got to go write. <laughs> <laughs> yes, get to it, or else you're not a real writer. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Believe me. I... <laughs> uh, and you can find Zan on her website, which is zanromanoff.com. And on Twitter, she is Zanopticon. That's Z-A-N-O-P-T-I-C-O-N. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did. Okay. And uh, you can find everything we talked about today, including her books, at yourcreativepush.com slash Zan. Z-A-N. Zan, thanks again. Thank you. Oh, great stuff. My thanks again to Zan for coming on the show. We've been trying to get together for close to a year now, so it was really a pleasure to finally have this conversation with her because a lot of great things came from it. As you know, one of the big themes from it was this idea of needing permission from the outside, needing that external permission before you feel like you can go forward with whatever your creative passion is. But as we saw through Zan, at the end of the day, you always need that permission from yourself. Even when those opportunities come up like they did for Zan, uh, you can be shell-shocked when you find yourself having that permission. When somebody literally asks you to write a book, something that you've been waiting for somebody to ask you to do uh, in your subconscious before you can kind of go through and make the book yourself, and there you are without a book because you didn't give yourself that permission before. So regardless of what you do creatively, Give yourself that permission right now. You never know when those opportunities will come. So you want to be prepared and you want to be confident in yourself. Like Zan said, if you get an opportunity like that, if somebody asks you to do that, if you get that external permission, it solves nothing because you still have to go through that process yourself. If you sell your first book, all you can do is check selling your first book off of your list and it really solves nothing else like Zan said. Nobody else in the world gets to tell you that you're a writer. Nobody else in the world gets to tell you that you're an artist, a photographer, a painter, an origami maker, whatever it is that you do. You're the only one that gets to tell yourself that you're that thing. You're the only one that can grant yourself that permission. Opportunities might come, and they might come at just not the right time. So try to make yourself prepared as much as you possibly can be for when those opportunities come. If they come, most likely you're going to be the one that has to go out and get the opportunities yourself, but be ready if they do come. On Monday's show, we have David Zinn, and oh my gosh, what a fun conversation I had with him. He is a freelance illustrator and street artist from Ann Arbor, Michigan. He specializes in small-scale, improvised, and lighthearted chalk art. What he does ends up disappearing. <laughs> when it rains i mean his his work is not permanent and it was so interesting to pick his brain about what that's like and also what it's like to make these tiny little masterpieces on the sidewalk and then walk away from them and not even look at the reactions of the people that see it on the ground and are surprised by it so a really fun one for you on monday uh, you can find more about David on his website, which is zinart.com, Z-I-N-N-A-R-T.com, or on Instagram, he is David Zinn. Uh, or you can head to today's show notes page, as always, to find everything we talked about today, as well as links to his stuff at yourcreativepush.com slash 235. 
But that is all I've got for you today. Hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done and we will be here for you on Monday if you need that push again. I love you all. Have a wonderful, productive, fun weekend and we will see you next time. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.